The title of the presentation is Low Power Verification of ARM CPU Subsystem Using IEEE 1801. Amit uh, received his BTEC in Electric Engineering from Indian Institute of, Delhi, of Technology in Delhi in 2002 and joined the Memory Solutions Group in Nest in Microelectronics, India in the same year. He has worked on memory design and is currently involved in the design of SRAM process sensors and adaptive memories. In addition to memories, He's involved in no, low power, expert for memory power reduction at architectural level. Raven is a uh, BTEC graduate from Indian Institute of Technology, Gowati uh, in ECE, having eight plus years of experience in front end design and verification. He has worked extensively in IP level functional verification. Presently, he is working on CPU subsystem team at ST Microelectronics a low power verification using simulation and formal techniques. Okay. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so is my voice audible? Yeah, go ahead. We can hear. Okay, okay. So very good afternoon to all of you. Um, so today we would uh, talk about low power verification, specifically of, of multi-core CPU subsystems that are becoming quite prevalent nowadays. We would be covering a few interesting examples of issues that we caught during low power verification of uh, our real real-time subsystem. And I have my colleague Varun. So my name is Amit. And I have my colleague Varun also along with me to deliver the talk. So uh, let me start by quoting the recent ITRS roadmap. It says, in the past, performance was the one and only goal. While today, we need minimization of power consumption drives IC design. So reducing power consumption is the key for battery operated devices. Which in, the, which in themselves are not limited to handheld devices anymore. With the advent of Internet of Things, such devices are there to go exponentially. The other side of the coin, which is the plugged-in devices, is also facing the heat of mini, minimizing power. Today, approximately half of the dollar budget for the huge data centers goes into infrastructure for cooling such devices. So the point I'm trying to make is that the fact that reducing power, it, it, it must play a balancing force to enable high-speed operations in modern SOCs. Maybe for enabling longer battery life, or for low energy in general, or long-term reliability of the device. ST has had a very long relationship with ARM-based CPU subsystems. As we can see, we have uh, more than 15 years of relationship with ARM. With the advent of smartphones, tablets, and high-end set boxes, we have demonstrated clock speeds in excess of 2.5 gigahertz. But the question is that, was all of this possible without using low-power techniques? The answer, obviously, is no. So in this talk, we will focus on the low-power features that we have implemented in our subsystems, and then the verification complexity that it has brought along with it. We will also discuss a few use case examples to highlight the low-power verification challenges that are very specific to multi-core CPU subsystems. So let's look at how the, uh, the CPU subsystem in our case looks like. So we have, uh, this, this is a quad core CPU subsystem. So we have four cores. In this case, they are of uh, Cortex A53, uh, which is uh, proprietary from ARM. So uh, this shows that we have used four CPUs in, uh, uh, two, in, in an arrangement of two pairs. So each pair comprising two CPUs. And at the, at, the, at the bottom, we have the logic 
which is the top level and that also includes the uh, L2 memories, level 2 cache memories and the Visa 2 clock manager. All these uh, CPU is accessible to the outer world by uh, AXS standard. Uh, so in, in our project, we had uh, made this arrangement using uh, 28 nanometer FTSOI technology. Now, one important thing that we have to understand here is that unlike normal SOCs, CPUs are general purpose processors, which means that the load on the CPU may vary depending on the application. To achieve very high energy efficiency, we must have a wide, a varied range of frequencies and corresponding voltage so that we can optimize in the overall energy that we consume. So therefore, we have an extreme DVFS, dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. By this we mean that we can think of a scenario where we operate at 0.6 volts and in fact at 0.6 volts we are able to achieve around 1 gigahertz performance thanks to the FDSOI technology and at the same time we can scale up the voltage to 1 or 1.1 volt and extract performances in excess of 2.5 gigahertz. So how do we, how do we uh, uh, manage such a large range? So first of all, we have to, we have to define multiple voltages of, of the CPU subsystem. So note that uh, in red, uh, just a minute. In, in red, we have, uh, we have things that we have to manage through the IEEE 1801, uh, which is also commonly known as the UPF format. And in the blue, as we go along, we see that we also have to augment the original RTL to have uh, no power uh, controllers and so on, which we will see a little while later. So let's focus on the multiple voltage domain of it now. So what we see here is that we have three kinds of voltages for the CPU subsystem. One is VARM, which is at the top. This VARM voltage is driving the entire CPU. Now this has to be different from the rest of the SOC because the CPU, as I said earlier, has to have a, a, a varied range from 0.6 volt to 1.2 volts, for instance. Well, while the rest of the stock may have one or two voltage and frequency points. Then we have, so, so that justifies the difference between the ARM and the SOC, which is at the bottom. The one in the middle, which is called VSAFE, is present to enable retention features. We will talk about it a little more in detail as we go along. But the important thing to note here is that we have divided the entire SOC, entire CPU subsystem, sorry, into three voltage domains. And this we have achieved using the 1801 format. So now, uh, if we have two voltage domains, uh, any, uh, any cross domain crossing between two voltage domains, there has to be a level shifter. So the level shifter can scale up the voltage or scale down the voltage as needed. So it rather shifts from one voltage domain to the other. So we can see through arrows that these level shifters are present at the boundary of voltage domains. And again, these level shifters, as they are in red color, so they are uh, they are part of the one into one format. Then we have power switches. So this this is a little more interesting. So uh, now, as we said, that we have to have uh, uh, a, a range from 0.6 volt to 1.1 volt. One what is important is that the memories cannot uh, are not functional to such low voltages. So if we have memories which are reasonable in area, they would start to limit the women of the of the CPU. Which means that we have to have a mechanism where we can shift the memory array voltage 
to V safe, which is at a higher voltage when we are going into very low voltage. So that means that when you are in very low voltage, you will have memory which have been powered up by V safe, which is let's say 0.9 volt, which is the one in, in, in cyan color. And when you are at very high voltages, you switch the array voltages back to the arm to extract maximum throughput. Then, uh, since we have such kind of uh, 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 different kind of switches, which, which, which shifts the level and so on, we must have controllers, power controllers, which these, these controllers have to be augmented inside the original RTL in order to make the entire system work. So for example, if you if you want to switch from one switch to the other, in the case of memory power switches, you would have certain constraints like stopping the clock or following certain sequence, which must be which must be uh, uh, take, which must be taken care of by an OPP controller, as we have said here. But the, the idea is that we need to have a power controller embedded inside the RTL. And then we can have sensors as well. So here we are talking about process sensors, which monitor the process uh, after the silicon is out. And we can you know, perform binning, process binning. And we can uh, have slower parts moving at a higher voltage and, and faster parts at a lower voltage, and so on. So this is about DDFS. Now, as you said, this is a multi-core CPU subsystem. So we have four cores. The question is that, do we really need all the four cores all the time? The answer is no, because uh, it depends on the load. So we need to have a mechanism where we are able to partially switch off as many number of cores that are not needed and switch on only bare minimum number of cores as per the requirement. So we have to have an infrastructure where we have we can enable partially shut down. So here, so I'll just recap uh, again. Uh, so here we were trying to build the concept of a dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, where we talked about why CPU subsystem is different for, from the rest of the SOC because it has it, it, it and the, the the performance should depend on the on the on the payload. So to support this, we have an extreme DVFS on the CPU where we have 0.6 volts to 1.1 volt of operation voltage and frequencies of the order of 1 gigahertz to 2.5 gigahertz. So in order to do that, we, we saw that we had to build multiple voltages and power switches for the memory array and sensors and power controllers. We saw that uh, the ones in the red, they have to be built using IEEE 1801 format, which is commonly known as UTF 2.0, while the ones in the blue, which is sensors in the power controllers, they have to be augmented inside the RTL, the original RTL. Uh, so these controllers will take care of uh, the sequences that have to be respected for the switches and for the, for the level shifters. Then we look at the need for partial shutdown where in the context of multi-core CPU subsystems, we uh, should be able to switch, switch off the cores that we do not use. So for example, out of four cores, I, if I need only one, I should be able to switch off the other three. In order to do that, we uh, studied the concept of uh, multiple, volt, multiple power domains. And Power switches. So these power switches we could uh, independently control the power of any power domain, and then in between the crossings of the power domains, we need to insert isolation cells. So I think this was where uh, we lost the connection. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, so then we'll talk about features like retention, where we would like to retain the information inside the RAM arrays. So we have dual rail memories. So by dual rail memories, we mean that the array and the telemetry logic of the memory is, is so we can power supply the array with a different 
voltage, which is in this case V safe in cyan color. And while the periphery drives its power from the from the app. And then finally, the uh, word on body biasing. So body biasing uh, or bulk biasing is the technique which can be used to boost the performance in terms of uh, speed at the cost of leakage, or which is called typically called as forward body bias. And uh, and additionally, it can be used in the other way where it can be used to reduce the leakage at the cost of uh, speed which is typically referred to as reverse body bias. So we have implemented an on-chip body bias generator in this case because in FTSOI technology, uh, we can uh, really use the body bias lever by applying body biases up to 1.2 volts in the, on the positive side and up to minus 1.2 volts on the negative side. So we need to have embedded body bias generators which can generate such negative voltages so these uh, are part of the RDL. While there is another interesting thing, which is the voltage connects, because the RDLs will produce a port, which has to be connected to the substrate of the ARM um, digital domain, which is done through the IEEE 1801. So here we need uh, a connection between RDL and 1801. So uh, the key takeaway from this slide is that in order to achieve low power functionality, we have uh, uh, we have multiple new IPs like body valve generators, OPG controllers, which have to be embedded inside the RTM. Second, we need to have we need to have in power intent information, which where uh, the I, the 1801. Uh, infrastructure tools to be very handy, so we define all the power intent using that. And third, we need to have uh, body. Uh, we need to have IPs uh, like uh, like memories and PLLs, etc., which need to have power information along with it. So some kind of power aware inside the inside the normal behavior model. So once we have all of this, uh, and since we are supporting so many low-power features, we that that automatically brings along with it the the complexity in terms of design verification. So here we are focusing on simulation-based verification, where normal sim simulations have to be complemented with low-power simulations. So the input to the low-power simulations is the CPU subsystem RTL. With the uh, with the enhanced RTL, then the power intent, and then the hardware to blitz, which are capable of handling the low power behavior, and they also contain some checks related to voltage and signal level constraints. For example, at 0.6 volt, the memory should have some particular signal pin setting as one or zero or something like that. So all these constraints have to be modeled inside the uh, IP documents. So using all these three as inputs, we, learn, we run low power simulations. And the output is the checks that we have to perform. These checks can be uh, related to uh, power domain switch off on. They can be related to uh, uh, DDFS. They can, and, and the interesting thing is that they can be related to uh, one particular state and they can also be related to sequencing between various states. So for instance, you can say that one check is that at point 0.6 volt, this pin must be asserted to high. So this is one constraint. The other constraint is that if you have to move from 0.6 to 0.9, you have to follow a particular sequence. Or you have to move from power down to power up, you have to follow a particular sequence. So these are the checks that we have to uh, verify. Additionally, uh, we have power, so PSD stands for power state tables. So we define power state table inside the power intent. And we have to ensure that we achieve 100% coverage in terms of power state tables. So that means that we have gone through all the power states. We have gone through all the possible transitions. And this ensures that the verification is complete. Now, going forward, we will quickly highlight a few uh, real cases that we encountered 
which brings into perspective the complexity the, of low power verification in the context of multi-core CPUs. So let's just briefly go to the power sequence first. So imagine that we are in, so here it shows uh, the CPU subsystem consists of two clusters. So each cluster can consist of multiple CPUs. And then there is an L2 cache arrangement at the top level RTL. Now this, uh, the green, when, when you see the color green, that means the power domain is on and running. So we are in state A. So if you have to shut down one cluster Y, we go in state B. And this is the sequence that we have to follow. The interesting thing to note here is that apart from a uh, standard sequence like clamping the outputs and shutting down, we also have to additionally perform few other steps like flushing the cache or flushing the pipeline, the cluster X pipeline because it is a CPU which has multiple stages of pipeline. Then we have to flush the L1 cache on the data contents and then write them back to the L2. And then when we when we decide to switch the entire subsystem off, that is we go to state C, then we also have to we are to, we also have to flush the L2 cache because now the L2 cache also has to be flushed. So you see that we have to follow a sequence which not only consists of clamping and shutting down, but also consists of inherent CPU operations. Now this is relatively straightforward at this level, but the problem increases when we talk about Sequence of sequence. Okay, so before that, let's talk about the power up sequence. So from state C, you can go to either D or E. That means partial power up. And then you can go to state F, which is full power up. So we can go to one, from any one state to the other state, uh, which are, which are, you know, any, any, any authorized transaction we can make. Now the problem is that if, if, if we verify uh, that going from B to C is working fine and going from C to D is working fine. So that means when, when we are shutting off, this sequence from B to C is working fine and from C to D, which is partial power up, that is also working fine. But one interesting case we figured out was that if we have a, a, a combination of sequence, which is you go from C to D, that means you power up, partially power up the CPU subsystem, and then you decide to go to shutdown again. So theoretically, you may argue that we, we are moving from known states. I mean, we have verified partial power up, and we have verified full system shutdown. So what is the issue? Well, interestingly, we found an issue exactly in this sequence, and the issue was that we were not able to go to shutdown. And that was because the L2 flush, so we, we provided a, a request for the L2 flush, and we never got the acknowledgement signal. This was because of some reset handling during, uh, during power down states, which was the final, uh, the, the, the final reason. But this is what we observed in the simulation, that we did not get L2 flush. So the key point that we want to drive here is that there are multiple scenarios which means the combination of sequences that have to be verified for a multi-core CPU subsystem. And therefore, this increases the verification complexity multifold. Another example that we would like to highlight is in the context of DVFS. So, so this is a very standard thing that we have, uh, we have uh, and at the top we have voltages from 0.6 to 1 or 2 volts in steps of 100 millivolts. And we just made a cartoon to show that the clock frequency is increasing as you increase the voltage. So this we refer to as different, vol different voltage frequency points. So this is standard. Now where does the complexity add up? The first complexity adds to when you say that there are QIPs where you need to maintain certain settings for certain pins. For instance, you have memories and you have a low voltage enablement pin. So that low voltage enablement pin must be set to one when you are at lower voltage, which is 0.6. 
and then that can be set to zero when you are at a higher voltage. So meanwhile, uh, in between there are two voltages, 0.8 and 0.9, where both settings are allowed because that those are the voltages where you can do a transition on these pins. So that is one design constraint. Let's assume. The other design constraint is coming from the memory array power switches that we saw, where we saw that for low voltage modes, we switch to reset supply, which doesn't go that low. So for example, when we are in 0.6 volts, the reset supply remains at 0.9 volts, and therefore we are able to do memory operations. While on the other hand, when we are moving at very high voltages, then we supply the memory array with the normal ARM voltage, the ARM, to extract maximum performance. So essentially, uh, through memory array power switches, what we, are, what we are able to achieve is the best of both worlds, which means enabling lower voltage operation for the memory and not compromising on the performance at highest operating point. So the, the, the thing here is that with this low power feature, there is an additional constraint of sequencing between when you have to switch this, this, this power switch from VSAFE to VR. So as you can notice that the first constraint that is coming, which is a very straightforward constraint, is that the clock must be off during this transition. So now, as I said earlier, uh, the verification complexity comes from the fact that such kind of design constraints, we have just shown two, but such kind of design constraints exist in our design and we have to verify that each operating point is working correctly in terms of pin settings, etc., etc. Another, another complexity comes when we have to transit between various OPPs. So for instance, imagine a case that we have to make a transition from 0.7 volts to 1.0 volts. So first of all, uh, we cannot make a transition directly from 0.7 to 1.0 because we have to have a state where we switch the memory power switch from VSAFE to VM and that has to be done in a controlled way. So what I'm trying to say is that we have intermediate states like 0.8 volt, 0.9 volt, 1.0 volt, 1 1 1 volt, etc. And in all those intermediate states, the, 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 the constraints must be satisfied. And then there is a control sequence involved, during which also all the constraints must be satisfied. So this is where the, the verification complexity increases in, in, a, in, a, in a standard DVFS sequence. Now that's not all. Uh, we also have body bias states. So, uh, so body uh, just. So we also have body bias uh, states where uh, body voltages are generated by on-chip generators. So uh, this will include more controllers, etc., and which further increases verification complexity. So we have not touched upon uh, uh, that aspect in the interest of time. So, uh, to sum up, what we have seen is that the low power is becoming a necessity nowadays for every kind of chip, every kind of application, rather most kind of chips and most kind of applications. We can implement the low power techniques using uh, the IEEE 1801 format, where we define the power intent, and we have to augment the RTL with controllers, no, no, no. controllers, and Then we, uh, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have combination of power sequences, we have extreme DVFS. I, mean, I think you're going to have a lot of that. Related to, uh, related to pin constraints and sequencing constraints, etc. So all of that posing a huge challenge in uh, verification complexity in terms of low power. And we would like to sum up by saying that uh, you know we require specialized methodologies and support from tools, EDA vendors, in order to achieve uh, uh, 
100% verification targets to avoid any silicon bugs. Uh, so uh, that's all from our side. Okay. We just started to lose you a bit, Amit. So thank you very much for your, thank you for your presentation.